From Daylight and Media 3 Limited, I'm Kazuki Akiba. I'm Tara Hori. And this is a new season of Sayonara Baseball. This is a podcast where you and I find unseen baseball gems by analyzing them alongside different trends, news, and motivation behind many moves around the league today. And today, in this off-season episode, we discuss the changes happening in the minor league and how that impacts the game. Baseball. I'm Kazuki, and here's my co-host and our contributor, Brandon Beiser. Welcome back. Thank you, Kazuki, and welcome back, everyone, to another episode of Sayonara Baseball. Uh, we are in the off season. It is December. It has started to snow on the East Coast. We got a blizzard this week, so Kazuki and I have been thinking about what to talk about during the off season. Uh, the winter meetings have begun for the most part. Uh, trades and free agency has obviously begun. We decided to take a different approach when we're talking about the offseason. We have been discussing a lot of the topics that are baseball or baseball adjacent, I like to say. Uh, after our discussion, our last podcast about the role of analytics, we started looking at other topics in baseball that have been talked about throughout the year. And we want to shine a light on a few of them. And this episode for our first offseason podcast is a special one. We decided to talk about something that we did not have in 2020 that a lot of people throughout the country dearly miss, and that was minor league baseball. Uh, minor league baseball is going through a transformation right now. Uh, as of the end of the 2020 Major League Baseball season, the minor league baseball's agreement between minor league baseball and Major League Baseball ended. That gave Major League Baseball the opportunity to reformat all of minor league baseball with respect to Major League Baseball, all the affiliations, realignments, divisions, everything. We currently know a lot of what's happened. In the first weeks of December, we saw that 160 previous teams in minor league baseball were reduced to 120. There have been two rookie or summer wood bat leagues or rookie leagues established from former teams. Uh, Roughly 90% of the teams that were lost were mostly single A teams. Single, there have been now five divisions of minor league baseball. We used to four. They yeah, lost we a lost single a short division. season, I think. Um, right, short teams. season single A has been removed. And also Rookie League is, I think, completely gutted. R- rookie League has been reformatted. There's a lot of reformatting. So right now we have 120 teams who are invited to join minor league baseball with new affiliations possible. And that's a traumatic change in minor league baseball. And some, te- some cities are going without minor league baseball. Some teams are getting minor league baseball they previously didn't have. Some teams are going up, down, a lot of reaffiliations. However, through all the tumult, the beauty that is minor league baseball is the fact that there are 120 now, 160 previously teams. These teams have amazing histories, amazing names, amazing state, amazing promotions that sometimes are viral content on social media, but for a lot of people, they are their hometown teams. We are not experts in minor league baseball. We love it for exactly the reason we talked about, the fun team names, the fun games, the fun promotions. Therefore, we decided to do something a little bit different for Sign Our Baseball this episode. Yeah, for this time, we actually brought a special guest who's a major expert in minor league baseball, but also just history of baseball. He just has a huge wealth of knowledge about the league and even other sports. We decided to invite uh, Mr. Todd Radom on with us today. And I'll tell you a little about Todd. Todd is a graphic designer whose work can be seen all across sports stadiums across the country, predominantly baseball stadiums. Uh, he is also an author. He wrote a book previously about minor league base about major league baseball uniforms called Winning Ugly: A Visual History of Baseball's Most Unique Uniforms. In 2020, he was also a weekly guest on Baseball Tonight's podcast with ESPN with Buster Olney as the host of the weekly quiz, talking about different trivia and tidbits for different stadiums and teams. And he is currently published a new book about the NHL called Fabric of the Game, the stories behind the NHL's names, logos, and uniforms. 
Today, we're going to talk to Todd about the thing he knows best. What makes minor league baseball so special from this point of what we see on the field in terms of the designs and the team names and the nicknames. So we'll get into that with Todd shortly. Uh, and I hope you enjoy our first guest segment on Sayonara Baseball. Coming up after the break, Brandon and I will be talking with the great Todd Radom. We're here with Todd Radom to discuss the the love of minor league baseball. And Todd, just as uh, I had when I started, before I even introduced myself when I joined the podcast, my first question to you is, when you hear minor league baseball, what is your fondest and favorite memory? Wow. I mean, just first of all, thank you for having me. Got to say that right off the top. But minor league baseball to me is about fun. I think about times at the ballpark with friends, with my own kids. And it is such a different experience from going to a major league game. And I can't wait to do it again. My real first question is talk about your history with minor league baseball teams. I, on your website, the image that first comes up is the Wichita Wind Surge, which is a team that was supposed to begin playing in 2020 that didn't. Uh, it was originally the AAA affiliate that moved from New Orleans to Wichita and now is now becoming a AA affiliate. But talk about just your experience working with Wichita and previous minor league baseball teams and how it's different from working with a major league baseball team. My professional career in design for sports goes back of just about 30 years. And, you know, as is the case with just about everything in our lives, you never forget your first. And my first job working as a designer in professional sports was for a minor league baseball team. It was for the Knoxville Smokies, uh, Southern League, double A affiliate at the time of the Toronto Blue Jays. And, uh, you know, rebranding this team, they were the Knoxville Blue Jays previously. So making them into the Smokies was my first job as a professional sports designer. So the minors are very special to me, uh, starting with that. And then moving forward, one of, you know, I mean, I've done a lot over the years, goes without saying it's a long time, but as a guy who's a native New Yorker, I've lived in the area my entire life. I did the Brooklyn Cyclones back in 2001. And, you know, that was really special to me for a number of reasons. Uh, again, native New Yorker, somebody who loves history, the opportunity to uh, create the brand for a team, the representing Brooklyn, the first team in Brooklyn, first pro team in Brooklyn since the Dodgers left was really special. And all these years later, they still use the logo. So minor league baseball, uh, you know, the, 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 the roots are very thick. Uh, the interpersonal relationships uh, are really thick. I've worked with minor league baseball, the offices in St. Pete for years and years and years now on all kinds of stuff that, isn't necessarily on my website, but it's part of my history. That's incredible. Uh, speaking directly about the, I guess, since we're opening about, we want to talk a lot about different teams, different logos and how we look at them today. The Brooklyn Cyclones is a great story. They, their baseball park, for those who are not familiar, is on Coney Island's property. It's a be it looks beautifully over the, the sound and the river area. So when you think about Miley Base, we think about the Brooklyn Cyclones type of environment. Uh, for our own edification, uh, I spent time in Little Rock, Arkansas. Uh, the Arkansas Travelers, when they were a St. Louis Cardinals affiliate, they played at Ray Winder Field, which was a old, old state fairground type ballpark right off the highway. So a home run would literally dent a car. Uh, and so when you think about minor league baseball, we a lot think about the most of the cities. There are 160 teams prior to 20, 2021 season. Now they're 120. And we'll talk about a little bit. But you think about the nicknames. And Cyclones is a great story about like their nickname. So when you think about like you should watch the Blue Jays become the Smokies, what's it like to watch a team nickname come to life, especially in minor league baseball, because they're so unique and different than when you get a major in professional sports. I am a believer that when it comes to sports of all kinds, but particularly for baseball and particularly for minor league baseball, the game and the passion for the game lives and breathes at a very, very local level. So when we talk about the minors, 
Uh, you know, Brooklyn's an outlier because Brooklyn is Brooklyn. It's huge. It's, you know, it's different from just about any place. I think we agree in minor league baseball, the smaller places, uh, you know, I think of going to games in, in Wilmington, North Carolina with a buddy of mine back in the nineties, lived down near there. But anyway, you know, the fact that minor league baseball is all about this, this hyper local sense of place really informs the names uh, it informed the naming of the Cyclones, uh, which I thought was terrific. I was not in on the naming of that. I was on the visual part, but I immediately got it. And, you know, uh, we talk about there's heritage involved and there are crazy names involved. And it's just all fun because, like I said, right off the top, the minors are all about fun. Do you have any particular minor league baseball nicknames that are your favorites? I'm just curious. <laughs> wow, that's a good question. I mean, you know. Being a history guy and, you know, which I alluded to just a few minutes ago, you know, these old time teams that still exist, the Toledo Mud Hens and Chattanooga Lookouts of the world. And again, you know, when we talk about still existing, knowing that as we're having this conversation, there are a lot of things in flux, you know, some of the crazier, newer names, the uh, Binghamton uh, Rumble Ponies or, you know, I mean, I, again, I, I think that it depends on where this is and uh, what the reasons for those names. Is. And sometimes they're a little bit of a stretch, but I think the fun theme resonates across the board and throughout. And I will say as a, you know, as a visual person and somebody who does what I do, some names are easier to impart than others. Uh, and, and uh, you know, that's part of the discussion as well. Kazuki, I'll ask the same question to you as someone who's learning about Miley baseball now a little bit. What do you think are your favorite nicknames? Uh, you know, there's some really out there names that I would never think of. And I hope like Cleveland uh, Indians, now Cleveland baseball team, hopefully could come up with something creative like that. But I honestly, the Jacksonville uh, Jumbo Shrimps, <laughs> that's like a really out there name. Like who has like a mascot of a shrimp was like a ripped muscle. Like <laughs> that's just really funny. And and of course, the Marlins would take that as their uh, minor league affiliate. So... <laughs> Yeah, and, and even like thinking about, you know, all these changes that I'm, I know we're going to be discussing a little bit, the St. Paul Saints, this, you know, this, this team suddenly gets elevated to AAA status. And the St. Paul Saints, of course, you know, the name dates back uh, a long, long ways. I'm not exactly, I know I've studied this before. I don't have the information off the top of my head, but it goes back over a century. It's not a crazy name. But uh, it is important to the region, and as they uh, are elevated to this new space and uh, this great prominence, they bring that along with them. It's kind of a cool thing. That's a great story. I didn't realize the St. Paul States. I know they were an independent team, same with the Sugarland Skeeters, which we'll again talk about, which are now in a, went from an independent league team in Texas to being a AAA affiliate. Uh, as a side, I'll answer my own question. One of the ones that I recently came across, I think is absolutely phenomenal, is the Rocket City Trash Pandas. Uh, the AA affiliate um, in Alabama, I think is an amazing nickname. I did not like make the connection at all to the getting the um, nature of Alabama connection to the rockets and then the trash pandas as a raccoon. I had no idea what any of that connection was. I do a lot of research with that. Um, another one of my favorites, uh, is the Northwest Arkansas naturals just because it's, it's just a great one. And, uh, I told this story to Kazuki a while ago and I'll tell it to you, Tom, see what you think. Uh, there was an interesting essay I tried when I went to college. It was, if you had to pick a sports logo to represent you and your future, what would it be? And it was on the, it was the university of North Carolina, Chapel Hills application question. And I thought about this for a while and I wrote about the Tacoma Rainier's logo. I'm originally from Seattle, which is funny that Kazuki is there now. And I had remember seeing that logo like on a, like a billboard as a kid. And I was like, how cool would it be to have Mount Rainier pasted on your shirt? Because Rainier beer, Rainier chips, Rainier everything, the big R. And that was like the symbol of my home to me. And that's what I wrote about. And uh, I had to laugh because I wrote that essay and the admissions team at every college I applied to that I had interviewed with remembered my essay. It's like no one would ever write about that. And I told them the story that I took it from the University of North Carolina's essay because you're allowed to write any topic. And it was just like a crazy thing that someone picked a minor league baseball team as their affiliate, uh, uh, minor league baseball affiliate as like their logo for their future. So I thought it was a great story. And it got us why we're here today. And I think now where it's a good time to bring up what are we looking at the change in minor league baseball? Um, Kazuki and I alluded to it in our opening where 
160 teams started the year. We're now at 120. Uh, AAA looks very unbalanced. Uh, there's only 10 teams, West Mississippi and 20 are East, which is, that's not going to work. Uh, AA looks somewhat stable, I'll say. I'll, I'm curious for your opinion on that. But single A got just gutted. Uh, the California League is what happened. Uh, the Northwest League is completely different. There's no, the Brooklyn Cyclones, speaking of them, their original league, New York Penn League is gone. There's no rookie ball anymore. There's no short season A ball. So just talk about what your thoughts are and what's going on with Miley Baseball right now. We'll go off from there. Well, let me move back for one second, Brandon, and just tell you that uh, I created a logo for the Tacoma Rainiers probably 10, 15 years ago of a T and an R with the uh, compass behind it because they're a Mariners affiliate. And uh, it was, it's my own initials. So I've always been, uh, you know, very fond of that. But anyway, uh, to answer your question, yeah, I mean, this is a time of great flux and when we talk about the fact that the miners are all about, you know, community, the most grassroots experience, you know, certainly, you know, the affordability, taking your kids to a game and having that kind of access. It is incredibly sad to see uh, the, the uh, elimination, certainly, of leagues that have existed for so long, uh, of communities that are going to be very, very hard hit uh, by the lack of baseball. Um, I have to say, I looked at a map of uh, what we're looking at and what you just discussed. And there are voids that exist now where baseball existed in places that are not going to exist in the same form going forward. So, you know, it's tough. I mean, there, you know, I think about places like Lowell, Massachusetts um, that are, are losing a team. But anyway, you know, I think like everything, we're going to need some perspective to see how this shakes out. Uh, it sounds somewhat counterintuitive to the narrative, but I do think that there is going to be some stability that will be baked into this new system. You have, uh, you know, what were affiliations that were negotiated every two, four years, whatever they were. And there was a lot of flux in certain instances. Um, you know, the really stable relationships that define certain franchises, Rochester, for instance, which was a Baltimore affiliate for so many years and the Minnesota affiliate for so many years. You know, um, I think going forward, what I'm trying to say is that you're going to have 10 to 15 year guaranteed relationships with some of these parent clubs that I think will be good. But for the short time we mourn, we look at the, you know, at that map and we see voids and I don't think there's any other way to view it. It's kind of interesting that you bring, bring up the whole void thing. Cause I feel like with the whole uh, COVID pandemic, um, it's like baseball is obviously reflected by the economy and I'm in the media world. Uh, I work part of the Walt Disney company and we're losing a lot of our own TV stations, which are like local TV. So it's like essentially you're losing your local presence all over that because they're consolidating everything into one, like, I don't know, like one umbrella. And I think it's kind of frustrating for people who doesn't have that because major league baseball teams are usually located in major cities. So like people who lives in these like local rural area, they essentially lose their entertainment. Yeah, and, and, and if I can interject, I think that, you know, because I think it's important to bring up right now, people who work in your industry, people who work in journalism, local newspapers that still exist. It is no different from the people I know who work in minor league baseball. These are the people who want to get in uh, into sports. And they sleep on couches. They pull internships, which are less than financially rewarding. Let's just say that. Uh, they pull tarps. They sell tickets. They learn the game from the ground up. And this is the grassroots. These are the true believers. These are the people who make the sport what it is. And, you know, I know so many of these people, and I've heard so many stories. And you'd hate to think that the opportunities are not going to be there because there are less teams. You know, uh, I know, <laughs> as we all do, enough, you know, MBAs in the world, uh, you know, and and it's a little bit different having an MBA running a, a team as opposed to somebody who worked their way up from, again, pulling tarps, selling tickets, knowing this business uh, really from the roots. So that's sad, too. I mean, there's there's a lot there's a lot of levels of this of this instability. And, and I think it's important to point out the fact that minor league baseball as a construct, as we know it now, dates back over a century. Um, change is hard. Change is really hard. And when you see people you know affected by changes like this, 
that their entire, you know, their footings are just, you know, eliminated from under them. Um, it affects us and it affects our communities that are affected in very personal ways. I, I couldn't say it any better. Like it affects our communities in a very personal way because as both of you have pointed out, when you look at a minor league baseball team, it feels like a reflection of your community. Like the, the nickname carries weight in your community. The the team carries weight in your community. Um, I grew up mostly in Vermont and there is no more Vermont Lake monsters. They are, they are, they do not exist. And I remember watching the local Burlington free press cover the renaming of that team from the Vermont expos to Vermont Lake monster. And to see champs head just peek over the brim was it was before like virality was a thing on social media. Like that was a viral moment in Vermont to watch that logo just be unveiled. And it, it's sad to think that team doesn't exist anymore because that was like you said, it reflected everything. It was like a great story about the Lake Champlain. It was reflected in our team and our community and we don't have it anymore. And now closer to home with the changes that have gone on, uh, one of the first minor league baseball games I went to when I moved to the East Coast was a Trenton Thunder game. The Trenton Thunder went from the most pro, probably the most notable double A team in the country to their summer wood bat league. And now I, I think they're in agreements with that. And like, I remember the story on ESPN a couple years ago about bat, about rookie, the bat dog. I mean, the, yeah, the we're, we're losing something big here to your point. We're losing something big. And I'll, I'll tell you right now, I got an email just, you know, within the last couple of hours from a friend of mine who lives in Troy, New York. So this is outside of Albany, who is not a sports fan. But, you know, we go back and forth. I've known the guy for a long time. And he said, you know, we're losing the Tri-City uh, Valley Cats. He's like, why is this time? What is what's going on? So it's, you know, the three of us are having this conversation. We understand we have some background in sports and interest in it. But, you know, to somebody who is, you know, just part of, you know, very proud of where they live, and a taxpayer, you know, it goes without saying that in a lot of cases, uh, taxpayers have funded these facilities. It's, it's a hard thing to explain. And, you know, it, it, it comes down to, you know, this, this kind of, you know, we get into this kind of gross, you know, economic discussion, which is not what minor league baseball <laughs> is about. Um, listen, everything's a business, but yeah, it, it's a really hard conversation. And, and, Brandon, you know, as you said, like Trenton, Trenton was, you know, it's the state capital of New Jersey. It's a significant size market. Uh, at one time, it was a nice day. I mean, you know, I've been there many times. So, yeah, it's it's a it's a hard thing to sift through in so many ways. I will say, like I said, I, I think it's now called Arm and Hammer Park, which is, again, great. Arm and Hammer is based in the areas, which is a really interesting kind of nugget. Uh as much as we talked about some of the, the downsides of this, you did mention one thing that I really didn't understand. And I'm curious if you could explain a lot longer. The affiliations were like these very qu sometimes quick things. Like you go from one to the next and very quick. Like I think of um, a team that like Arkansas Travelers, where I grew up in Arkansas, they were the St. Louis Cardinal affiliate for like 30 plus years, which is unheard of. And then they jumped to the Angels and they jumped to the Mariners. And how does that so now they're expected to have much long to more long term agreements compared to what they did before? Is that considered a benefit, I presume, compared to what previously happened? You know, I, I suspect it depends on what your franchise is and where you're located. And, you know, one size does not necessarily fit all is what I'm trying to say. But certainly, you know, in terms of planning, listen, if you are, you know, there were teams and, you know, it, there was always this dance, this musical chairs thing that that went on when it came time to renew affiliations. And uh, I just remember, you know, uh, getting a flight, you know, getting a triple A AAA player from Edmonton to Miami <laughs> was, was not an easy thing to do. And thinking about this over the years, you know, the, the fact that the Red Sox, for instance, the Red Sox, uh, which had Pawtucket and I mourn their loss as well as their triple A affiliate for, you know, 45, 50 years, the fact that they had teams in Portland, Maine and Lowell meant that, you know, you are, you are uh, catering to people who are most naturally Red Sox fans. They're getting to see their, their prospects elevate through the system. You know, the Dustin Pedroyas of the world and Jim Rice and go way back Wade Boggs in Pawtucket. So, you know, the fact that, that the geographic, um, uh, alignments are now going to be a little bit better, 
people in the Twin Cities, for instance, if you're a Minnesota Twins fan, you can go see your best prospects 12 miles away or whatever that is. That's kind of a cool thing. Um, and, and, you know, to answer your question, there is stability built into that in many, many ways. If you are, uh, you know, and let, let's you know, put off to the side for a second some of these municipalities which have lost their clubs, but, you know, knowing that, for instance, you know, Syracuse is going to be affiliated with the Mets for the long term, it's good for Syracuse and it's good for the Mets. It's a little bit of a different story because I believe the, the Mets own that franchise. But, um, yeah, I, I think there are probably positives that do emerge from this for all of the negatives. That's a great point. I, I, I said the stability is my league. Something is you never expect. It's like because you, you jump the players jump leagues real, to go back and forth. But the fact that the teams have a little more stability is a great point uh, to your geography point. Uh, Kazuki and I were looking at the new affiliations um, earlier this week, and we noticed that some of them, like you said, are really interesting. They're very close to each other. Um, all the Miami Marlins affiliates are now in Florida, which is pri- previously was unheard of. I mean, they have Jacksonville, they have all as, as their new Jacksonville, Pensacola, and well, Beloit is close. There's always going to be an outlier in these relationships. <laughs> yeah. Ju- and Jupiter. Um, but your story about the travel, I remember a while ago, Las Vegas was the affiliate of the Mets for yep. a brief year. And you had to like, like to call up a someone like, in the Met systems, like get them on the plane to from Vegas. And it's like, what? And they, they, when they were the 50 ones, you got to fly them across the country. And uh, same with minor league hockey before they redid that whole system. It was, you were flying people from Manchester, Manchester, New Hampshire to LA for games. And it was crisscrossing the country. And that's. Yeah. That's, but, but like, listen, you know, it, at least, you know, that in the case of Vegas and the Mets, there are how many flights a day that go from Vegas to LaGuardia. As opposed to uh, the Edmonton to Miami relationship, which probably I've never flown from Edmonton to Miami personally, but it probably involves two changes of planes. It's probably not an easy thing to navigate. It is probably expensive. It is unwieldy and not a desirable thing for either party. That's correct. And as as I've studied the industry for many years, like when you get like those eye connections, it's like a movie sequel. It's like you're running going from this to this pinpoint to that. It's like the scene in Frosty the Snowman where I have to go from the North Pole. And it's like all the tickets he has to stamp. It's, like, it's the same thing. He's like, I keep going all the way all around. Exactly. Uh, it's it's really interesting. And I think of some of the teams like that are sticking around that are that have great stories. And I'd be curious if you if you have any of your own. Like the one that um, I think about uh, in the Northeast Lehigh Valley Iron Pigs still in the high Valley iron pigs with, 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 with the, uh, the, the bacon logo. That was an interesting one. Reading fighting fills, uh, uh, near and dear to the Northeast heart, the Hartford yard goats. Yeah. And those are, you just named three, three places, three stadiums that I've been to. Uh, Hartford is not terribly far from me. It's, you know, I, I think about this. I have a friend of mine that lives on the other side of Connecticut in Mystic, Connecticut, so basically near Rhode Island for mm-hmm. people who might be listening that aren't familiar with the geography. And I live on the other side of the Connecticut. So we meet up, we go to a Hartford Yard Goats game. It's a beautiful summer night, beautiful stadium. Both of the uh, Phillies affiliates that you referenced, Reading, which is this like primal baseball experience, this old time stadium. Love it. Absolutely love it. Um, and, uh, Lehigh Valley, Allentown, beautiful ballpark. I mean, I've been there a lot of times and if you are, you know, I think of a very close friend of mine, uh, who a big Phillies fan, and I've been to those ballparks with him and he, you know, I'll sit there and he'll talk about the prospects that he, you know, he's dug in on. he's like, this guy is going to be the second baseman of the future, what have you. So you think about these, you know, regional possibilities that don't always exist and, you know, it resonates beyond the convenience of travel and the streamlining of expenses. Just on that point, what are, what are your favorite state in minor league baseball? Cause there are so many, and like you said, you've been to some different ones and uh, they're pretty special. Uh, yeah. See the right ones. So what are your, uh, what are some I'll, your throw, I'll, throw, I'll throw a couple of them out. I'm going to miss Staten Island. Um, that's a great, you know, I mean, just what a backdrop with the lower Manhattan, the statue of Liberty, you take the Staten Island ferry there. It's a really unique experience. I love experiences when it comes to sports and you know, that's part of it. Brooklyn that you mentioned a little while ago, there is no better night 
than sitting in a ballpark, smelling the Atlantic Ocean, seeing all those lights and, you know, the, the amusement park rides and all that. I love it. Um, I do love Reading because I really feel like it's traveling back in time um, to this very, you know, pure, you know, you close your eyes and it might be 1950. Um, it's very cool. Um, I do love the St. Paul Saints ballpark, which I have not been to a game at, but I got a great tour of. Uh, I was actually in the Twin Cities probably about four years ago with Dave Winfield, St. Paul, Minnesota native. And we got a tour of that ballpark. And I would be remiss if I didn't talk about my friends in Wichita, uh, the wind surge. Um, you know, I spent four days out there last November. Seems like a million years ago for a lot of reasons. But that is going to be a jewel of a ballpark. I can't wait to go to a game there. Um, it is a, you know, like a tiny major league ballpark in the middle of this very thriving, interesting place. Yeah. On the topic of Win- of Wichita, um, if if you're able to share the story of that franchise, because it's an interest, it's an interesting story. I remember they were the New Orleans Zephyrs for a while, and then they became the baby cakes and then something happened and I probably lose the details there and they end up in Wichita and that's where you come in, uh, in this, in this saga. And they were the newest franchise supposed to start last year and we're hoping to see them in 2021. Yeah. I mean, so just, you know, in, in, uh, to sum it up, um, not a great facility, I guess in new Orleans, I never visited, but this was my understanding. New Orleans is an interesting kind of a place. It's a big city, but it doesn't have a, uh, thriving, um, corporate, uh, you know, community that would really, you know, help to sell their smaller suites and advertising and, you know, the stuff that makes it go. And um, anyway, they um, wound up uh, shifting to Wichita, Kansas, Wichita, Kansas, which if I'm not mistaken, is the 50th biggest city in the United States. So it's a decent sized market, Um, uh, an aviation hub, um, center of education. You know, it's a place with a lot going for it. Um, and uh, a place with a long history of baseball, of collegiate baseball, of various minor league clubs along the way throughout history, Texas League. Anyway, uh, you know, I was brought into the process by the late Lou Schweckheimer, who was, uh, you know, owner of, of the, um, you know, we'll talk a little bit more about him. But um, I had volunteered my services for some charitable work, um, you know, involving, uh, you know, grassroots baseball stuff. And I was brought in to rebrand that team or to freshly brand this new club in what Wichita, um, once they moved and it was an unusual opportunity. He wanted, they wanted a, um, you know, kind of a polished look, uh, something a little bit more, if, if, you know what I mean, major league, kind of like the Cyclones in a certain sense, um, you know, something stable that would stand the test of time, be around 20 years or so. Well, you know, here we are. And, uh, you know, they built this beautiful stadium, uh, of course, was supposed to be a triple A team. Uh, for people who are not familiar with the story, Lou, who was just, you know, baseball lifer, loved the guy, um, uh, contracted COVID and passed away during the summer. And, uh, you know, I just, I'm thinking about being with him in Wichita and that group, such a good group of people, um, back in November with all of the optimism in this world for this venture ballpark, bringing people in there. Um, and you know, our worlds have changed in a lot of ways. So anyway, uh, Wichita will now be a double A affiliate of the Minnesota twins. What a great organization. Um, you know, I'm close to the twins and a lot of a lot of ways. Um, and I think it's a very, very good fit, but a different kind of fit. And, you know, I guess that organization will go into 2021, uh, in a little bit of a different way that they envisioned, but I will say that I think the city is going to embrace the team. They will love this ballpark. I mean, just unbelievable. And, you know, the, the, the memories that will happen there, would not have happened and will not happen without Lou Schweckheimer and without the people in that organization. And it's a meandering path. And I'm meandering here in a little bit <laughs> of, of uh, a little bit, but um, you know, it's going to be very meaningful when it does happen and everybody is together again. 
that's a great story. I remember reading the story about how he did pass away from the um, contracting coronavirus, which was really sad because he never s- truly saw this dream that he had built. He wanted to own a team so badly. And he owned that he finally got he got his wish, and then unfortunately terribly he passed away well and i would say you know lou was this guy and his stories were just unbelievable he is one of those people that i referenced earlier started out uh as an intern with the Pawtucket red sox a rhode island guy um who you know was affiliated with that with the Pawtucket red sox for years and years and years wound up being a you know a partial owner blah 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 so but a baseball lifer you know he would talk about pitching coaches from the seventies and all this stuff and, you know, a real baseball man and, you know, went out to Wichita to, you know, sell this vision, which was not an easy thing. You you guys know how this is, you know, uh, if a community invests a lot of money in a, in a, uh, in a stadium, it is not always, you know, a, a sweet process. So he had to get out there and be a salesman for baseball and for this, for this ballpark and, you know, first class all the way. I miss him every day. And um, I do think again, that his vision and the vision of the dedicated people who were his partners and friends and loved ones who are still with the ball club, that will be borne out. It's going to happen. It's like, I really hope the best for them. It was such a cool story to bring that franchise to Wichita, a team that you said had a franchise, lost it, right? and now they're there again. And hopefully I guess they'll be part of what, maybe the new Texas league. I'm not quite sure. We none of us are quite sure. Uh, but it's just interesting. It's interesting. You talk about the stadium being like this really cool environment. I talked about previous stadiums that are really special, uh, during the pandemic, one stadium really came a light to me, What I thought was so cool was I'm not sure if you've ever heard this story, but the, the minor league affiliate, the double a of the Marlins, Pensacola blue Wahoos, put their stadium and it's currently still available. Like I'm looking at the listing for our listeners. I'm looking at the listing right now. You can rent it on Airbnb. You can go out and rent for $1,500 a night. The experience, the ultimate baseball experience of staying at the Pensacola blue Wahoo stadium in Pensacola, Florida, overlooking the Gulf of Mexico. Uh, you get a 10, uh, bed bedroom in the clubhouse. You can use the field, um, the reviews are incredible about like, this is the most I've ever had in my life. I mean, like, I remember trying to walk on like Citizens Bank Park grass and getting yelled at. <laughs> uh, and to think about like, uh, I could stay at the Pensacola Blue Wahoo Stadium and have like modified, we, we play, because can I play on a, uh, a very, very lovely softball team in New York City. It's like, we have like spring training in Pensacola. It was like, it'd be really fun. It was like, we floated that idea by a bunch of our friends. I was like, we wouldn't do it. But it was, <laughs> you can't imagine this. Like, I, I think of the settings for some of these stadiums we talked about earlier. And I will, now we brought up again, like the ones by the highway. Like you, you can't beat the ones by the highway. Um, uh, the one that I think of again, I think it's now Lados Field, but it's, it's Cal Ripken Field to me. Is yeah, yeah, yeah. I drive uh, past there on 95. And, right, you know, right off 95. You can't miss it for all of our listeners who drive down 95 between Philadelphia, Washington, D.C. Before you get to Baltimore, Look on if you're traveling the southbound lanes, look to the right. There's a baseball stadium right outside of Baltimore. Um, and the Aberdeen Ironbirds looks like it looks like a driving range net just sits right in net, Right. And and I mean, two things come to mind. Number one, uh, you are, I mean, if the most resourceful marketers and ingenious marketers, maybe on earth are minor league baseball people, right? So we are faced with a pandemic and they are not going to have games, but there are movies taking place, socially distanced meals on the infield in places, uh, the Airbnb story that you're talking about. And then the other thing that comes to mind with this weirdest of years and seasons was a minor league baseball ballpark got, you know, thrown into the public consciousness of baseball major league fans because Buffalo graduated to the major leagues for the first time since, (laughs) you know, in over a hundred years and as I call them, the Buffalo Blue Jays got a chance to show off Salem Field, uh, which is a terrific ballpark. I went to um, I went to a game there with a friend. I was giving a talk in Buffalo, uh, I think in, in April of 2017. So I went to, you know, it's maybe like the second game of the season. So if you go to a baseball game in Buffalo, you know, on, on uh, April 10th, you're going to get some weather. And we got a little bit of weather. And but a great ballpark, and again catapulted into major league status. It was so cool to see, hard by a highway that if you drove a few miles, you would be on your way to Ontario. So there you go. Yeah, and, and 
I think this is a great segue into like the fundamental right back to the final minor league baseball. And when I originally reached out to you about a month and a half ago, we were, I want to talk to you about what I think is one of the coolest things in all of sports, let alone baseball. And that is the Copa de la Diversión, the Latin heritage f- nights and seasons and promotions that minor league baseball does. Uh, for those who don't, I'll let Todd explain it further, but every minor league team picks a reflection of themselves in a Latin heritage feel. Uh, there are some teams that have the best stories I can imagine. Um, I personally am now the proud owner of a Round Rock Chupacabras and a Corpus Christi Corpus Christi Raspa shirt. Just because like how many times could you get a shirt that has a big like Italian ice looking thing on your shirt and never asking questions about it. Uh, so it's just one of the coolest things ever. I never got to go to one of the games, but I remember we had like like a, like a fantasy draft of the best logos and nicknames a couple of years ago amongst my friends. Uh, if you could talk about that and what you know about that, that'd be great. Cause it's just like a really unique promotion that minor league baseball does that other leagues have caught on to, but no one does like minor league baseball. I think you, I think you summed up pretty well. I think you got it. Um, but I think it also, you know, it dovetails with the, with a couple of things. It dovetails with the fact that as we have been seeing throughout this conversation, you know, minor league baseball teams are so, uh, integrated into their community. And I love the fact that, you know, there are some stories within this program that are so hyper local that uh, you love it. I mean, I'm not from some, any of these places, but, but, you know, hearing what this is all about and knowing what it might mean to, uh, you know, to the community, it's, it's pretty cool. The looks are cool. And I think it's really important to point out the fact that, you know, minor league baseball is, you know, it's unique in a lot of ways, but one of the things is that, that you just kind of have to stand back and, and consider is the fact that you're not selling players so much because the players come and go. You're not necessarily selling the history. You know, the New York Yankees can sell history that, you know, those pinstripes connect Babe Ruth to Mantle to Jeter and beyond. But uh, if you are, I don't know, any of the teams that, that are participating in this program, you know, you really have the opportunity to um, what I say uh, would be sort of like expanding your sense of identity and your sense of expression almost as a team and as a community. And this program does that in a very meaningful way and in a fun way. I think that's a great way to sum it up. I I never thought about it. Like you said, when you're selling minor league baseball, the players come and go very quickly. Like I can't think of any time, many times where the players really stick around more than maybe one, two seasons at most. And regardless of the league level, no, I mean the, I think of like, you hear about many players will say the minors for years and years and years, but they're not with the same organization. They'll bounce around. They're not in the same group. Like I think of uh, growing up like in triple and double a in Arkansas, we call players where they're maybe one or two seasons, but they made it to the Cardinals by the end. And we can remember like, well, I made it to the Cardinals. And it's just fun to realize that, like, I remember also, like, you get the injury rehab assignment players that come back and they're there for like a game, like Aaron Judge played for Trenton for a game. Derek Jeter played for uh, Trenton for like a game. And it's like a big deal. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Manny Ramirez, you know, with the rehab assignment. And uh, I think it was Pawtucket losing his diamond earring and, you know, them having to stop the game to look for it um, (laughs) in the (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> so these kind of stories though. Yeah. I mean, that's the thing. And, and we talked about it a while ago in the conversation, the affiliations in many cases kind of come and go. I think about the fact that I saw, you know, Johnny Damon play in, in Wilmington uh, when the blue rocks were, you know, a Royals uh, affiliate. And of course, you know, his career bounces around. He gets known as, you know, one of the Red Sox who ends the curse in 2004, has some stellar seasons with the Yankees, blah, 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 blah. But, you know, if you're, if you're, you know, some, there's somebody who's talking about, I saw Mike Trout play in, you know, Little Rock, I think, right? I mean, you know, he, right. I mean, and that that's part of the thing. But so you're selling, you're selling the, the sport, you're selling the accessibility, you're selling fun. And that's not a stagnant or static thing. It's, it's, it's so cool that you brought, like, let's have selling fun. Cause like they call, they call it the fun cup for the, the Copa de la Versión. And I just, I just love that. I think that's a great concept. 
I'm curious to hear what Kazuki says, because Kazuki, uh, for just for his background, is from a much larger city than I grew up in. He mostly had the Dodgers growing up in Los Angeles. So wait, as like you, uh, Kazuki, as you grew up, like what was your impression of Rally Baseball? And uh, Todd and I have really kind of gone back with about like all the things that we experienced from traveling and using them. You know, for me, because I'm from originally from L.A., like I had the Dodgers, you know, and downtown and you have the Anaheim Angels back. I still call them the Anaheim Angels. They're not the Los Angeles Angels of Anaheim. That is just some bogus right there. But um, I've never had this whole presence of minor league baseball until like I saw a bunch of Japanese programs. Like there's a former WBC uh, Japanese manager from 2017, uh, Hoshino, like going to different minor league game and actually showing how exciting it was, like, you know, to show stark difference between a major league game and a minor league game. Like if you go to any minor league game, they have some sort of entertainment every single inning, like during the breaks, like when, whenever they're warming up, like there's some people like dancing and there's some like hot, some hot dog eating contest in the third inning. Like it's just, I had this impression of, wow, like this is like creating some buzz and excitement. And so I was kind of was like trying to like ask a question of why do you think major league baseball kind of lacks that type of like fun and like excitement, like the minor league kind of promotes in all of their local communities. Well, and you don't have the traffic that you might have at Dodger stadium. Let's just say that as well. Right. Yeah. But you know, here's the thing. If you are the Los Angeles Dodgers defending world series champions right now, let's just put it that way. You know, you got Clayton Kershaw who finally breaks through, who has been a member of that organization for so many years. He came up through their system, future hall of famer, you know, he's been there for all these years. Basically, what I'm trying to say is the L.A. Dodgers are about Kershaw and Sandy Koufax, and they're about Jackie Robinson, and they're about Brooklyn, and they go back to 1890, and there's this thread of history that really matters, and you're, you know, you're, you're selling it. It's just a different kind of experience, I think. That's it. Whereas if you are, I don't know, Bakersfield or, you know, pick a Dodgers affiliate, um, you know, again, Vero Beach back in the day, right? You're, you're, you know, see the stars of tomorrow, have a hot dog and a beer, enjoy yourself. Your parking is free. A ticket is $3. It's just like, you know, it, it's completely different. It's a completely, you know, it's the same game. And, and you know, you talk about, um, yeah, I mean, I I remember going, you know, I, I was involved with the World Baseball Classic, for instance, um, from its inception, right? Since before its inception. I remember the first meeting on that was in 2004. I went to the first WBC uh, down in San Diego in 2006. And, you know, it's a different game. It's baseball, but it's different. Um, one other thing along this, and I would love to go to a game in Japan someday. I never have. I had the opportunity to go to Cuba in the late nineties. Right. And I'm seeing baseball and I'm seeing how kids even, you know, warm up and it's baseball. So it's this thing that's incredibly familiar, but it's a different form of baseball. The minors are a different form of baseball from the majors, just as, you know, extrapolated on down the line to little league, I guess. It's interesting. You bring up the concept of international baseball because during the pandemic this year, the entire baseball community in North America was introduced to Korean baseball. Yeah. Uh, and if you could speak on your experience of like, of being a part of the world baseball community, the classic itself, like you said like it feels different. Like what, what really feels different? Because like, I remember watching Korean baseball, there's not only fans, but I remember hearing the stories about like, they have dances and they, it's like, it sounds like college football more than. It's a cultural thing. And, and that, that, that's a great, that's a great example. Like, you know, you go to a college football game, it is a very different experience than going to an NFL game. And um, just, you know, being at that first WBC, there are fans from Mexico where, you know, it's like it's like watching a World Cup game where it's culture. Right. I mean, culture is the most important thing that that that, you know, defines so many parts of our lives. And, it, and it's a great thing. Right. I mean, it really gets right into the heart of this conversation. You know, I love to travel. I'm intellectually curious, I think. I think it's a good thing, right? I love going to LA uh, and, and, you know, I was there in January and it just, it always strikes me as like, I get out of that terminal and I see that crazy building that I like, I have to take a picture of every single time. It feels different. There's palm trees, right? I mean, it's just, it's completely different for where I'm from and what I'm all about. And uh, I think that, that with the international baseball experience, it is, again, there's something that's so familiar about baseball. There's three outs, but the way the game is played, the culture that surrounds it, 
is so different. It makes me think, and you know, it's a cool thing. So we have about a little bit of time left with you, but before we get to our, our last closing segment, uh, I want to talk about your most recent book that's being published, uh, your fabric of the game, the hit, the stories behind the NHL's names, logos, and uniforms. Uh, Kazuki knows, and Kazuki and I are both talking about, we be, we, I have become a very avid hockey fan. Kazuki is becoming a hockey fan. And we're just curious, like how you got involved with this, because uh, this past year has been one of the greatest things as a hockey fan being from Seattle. We have a team, we have a logo, and I am super excited to watch the Seattle Kraken. I have, I'm looking for listeners, my background on my computer is the new logo. I am so psyched about it. That release video is amazing. So talk about just briefly about getting involved in that project because it's not baseball, it's hockey. And like any, again, your favorite logos or any stories that you came across in your work. Yeah. So, I mean, you know, I've worked in all sports along the way. I've done a, a lot of work in baseball, no question about it. But, you know, I've done work with the NHL and, and uh, you know, uh, I'm, I'm old enough to remember the World Hockey Association. And having gone to, I used to live a block from Madison Square Garden when I was in college. And I would wait until the second period got underway. You could scalp a ticket really cheap and get into a Rangers game. And uh, anyway, the book Fabric of the Game the stories behind the NHL's uh, names, uh, looks, you know, uniforms and logos was an opportunity for me to uh, collaborate on a project with my buddy Chris Creamer from sportslogos.net. We've been talking for years about coming up, you know, doing something. And this just seemed like the right thing to do at the right time. We worked on it for three years. Uh, the project began really in earnest with me traveling to Toronto in, I, I'll tell you exactly, I went from, I went to a Yankees Astros playoff game at Yankee Stadium. Uh, and from there, I, I like, you know, the next morning flew up to Toronto. We visited the Hockey Hall of Fame Resource Center, which is the, you know, repository for history. It's where the Stanley Cup is kept, right? And, you know, old jerseys and sweaters and, you know, pucks and all this stuff. So, you know, as he says very eloquently, he says, you know, and I feel the same way. We know the Toronto Maple Leafs, for instance, are blue and white. Well, why are they blue and white? And why for why are they called the Toronto Maple Leafs? Every team has a story, including your Seattle Kraken, right? So we decided to dig in and we explored every team in the history of the National Hockey League, including the Montreal Wanderers, who played a handful of games in their first season. Their arena burned down and they were consigned to history, right? So they're in there. There are these teams that played a single season, the Philadelphia Quakers, right? <laughs> and and uh, there's stories to be told. So it was really cool to look into it, um, to find out more than, you know, I ever knew. Um, and we even, you know, we literally, the, the book went to press sometime in May. The Seattle Kraken, we know, are going to be, pardon the pun, unleashed, <laughs> uh, at a certain point, we get the heads up. It's going to be this week. We literally say to our publisher, stop the presses. We allotted two pages for the Seattle franchise. We included them in there. So to sum it up, my favorite, you know, I love hockey logos because if you think about a hockey uniform, um, it is all about the logo. It is big and, you know, it's complemented generally by stripes and big areas of real estate. So, you know, some of the great logos in all of sports are come from the NHL, the Montreal Canadiens, uh, CH, right? It dates back over a hundred years, connects all of these great players, championships and all that. But think about the Minnesota North Stars, the Hartford Whalers, which is every design dweebs uh, idea of the greatest logo in history, because it does a lot with a little it's got a Wales fluke. It's got a W for whalers. And there's an H hidden in the middle. I could go on and on and on, but it was a great project to be involved with. Um, immediate success right out of the gate. First printing was sold out in 48 hours. A second printing is happening as we speak. More books are going to land in the month of January. So fabric of the game. <laughs> That's a great story. And like I said, I'm glad you include this out, Kraken. I, I thought that release video was just really interesting. And like I said, it ties all back to what we, we, we talked about with, um, with minor league baseball in the sense that like you get these great stories behind these logos that are 
sometimes in professional sports, we're, crossing, I wanna, we're not going to, we're not saying that they, they don't, but there are these hyper local stories behind these very specific, specific things. Like I think of like the, like the asynchronous ones, like the Los Angeles Lakers, there are no lakes in Los Angeles, but you had the lakes beforehand. So you got to keep that story across. And then you think of like in hockey, like I, I think about some of the welfare fair logos that I talk about, and I know they reverse they released the reverse retro jersey, but you're seeing them come back like, um, to your heart for whalers one i think of one of the great logos is the winnipeg jets because it's the fighter jet inside a circle of a logo and they were gone for so long and then they came back and you see that logo and then you have the j-e-t-s and for those in new york it's like j-e-t-s that's a football team no j-e-t-s is a beautiful hockey team at a very humble little town of winnipeg manitoba so i'm it's just great to hear that so on that note we'll get you out on our final bit where we're called three strikes and you're out three baseball related questions uh to end our time with you today uh if you could pick your favorite baseball stadium past or present what would it be i'm gonna come in hot and i'm biased but i'm gonna say fenway park does that mean the next answer to your question a favorite baseball team is what i think it is i'm a boston red sox fan even though i grew up 10 miles north of yankee stadium i was born in manhattan uh but long story short and i will keep it short uh when i was a kid a young kid uh, we used to go out to the eastern end of Long Island, to Montauk, New York, to vacation. And my father would go back, work in the city. I was out there with my mother and my brother. And, you know, if you're eight years old, seven years old, it's boring. There's nothing to do. You know, you're at the beach every day. Yeah, it's the same thing every day. The only TV that, that we could get out there at that time before cable was from across Long Island Sound from Rhode Island. So I grew up watching Red Sox games. And that's why I'm a Red Sox fan. And I was there uh, for game four in 2004 uh, in St. Louis. You know, I'm a diehard. I was in L.A. I'm sorry, Kazuki, in 2018. Um, and I and I sat through all 18 innings of game three, as a matter of fact. Yeah, I mean, Red Sox to me is a pain of my existence. I am actually grew up as a Yankee fan because of my family um, being a huge Hideki Matsui fan and uh, for the Yuma Murray Giants. And I mean, I grew up as an Ichiro fan, but they liked the Yankees a lot more because of Matsui. So I had to root for the Yankees and watching that 2004 ALCS to this day is just so painful for me. It is. And, and just real quick, you know, Matsui is one of these players that even a uh, somebody on the other side of a rivalry would celebrate a classy skilled player who, you know, handle himself so well in New York You'd love him. On, I would have loved him on my team, but he's like the perfect stoic Yankee eternally for me. He was clutch. And when the funny part is, if you look at the stats of that series, like when he stopped hitting, no one was hitting. Like they were just done. They just died after that game for uh, Dave Roberts. Um, <sighs> Man. Uh, but, you know, that's a whole nother episode of this, actually. It, it is. Game by game. <laughs> Yeah. The, the, our third question is favorite baseball player, past or present. Wow. Favorite baseball player. I have no one. I'm going to totally like, you know, I'm going to, I'm going to no. And you know, part of it is because I know some players personally friendships with some guys. I mean, you know, they're your players who you love growing up. I love Carl Yastrzemski. I love Dwight Evans. Dwight Evans should be in the hall of fame. He is a Matsui like figure. Uh, kind of this stoic guy who just went out there, got the job done, was dazzling defensively, was an offensive juggernaut for a short period of time. He kind of gets forgotten. So, you know, you start with that. And then I will say like, you know, like anything else, I've worked in the game for 30 years. I've met a lot of people, you know, I'm kind of a humble brag to some extent, but uh, you, you stop becoming fans of, of individual players and you root for people to some degree. Uh, it's kind of weird, but yeah. You know, like, it's kind of funny that you mentioned that because that's how I feel with all the teams too. So like, I would say I'm a Yankee fan, but I have like all these respect for all these teams because I know their system. It's just so interesting to look at it. Like Tampa Bay Rays, I, I love that team a lot because of how well that's built. Red Sox, they have a great draft like pick and, you know, you got to respect Mookie Betts and all the great outfielders they had in 2018. Um, how they picked it up together. Like, you know, that, that was amazing. And Dodgers, like, you know, not really my team, but I respect that team. Like it's well built from the minor league and up, like, you know, you just have to root for like the system and how well it's built. Yeah. And I, and I went on a limb and just assumed that since you were from LA that you were a Dodgers fan. So I apologize for that. Not a horrible <laughs> transgression, 
but yeah, like, you know, I didn't have a dog in the fight watching the World Series this year, as weird as a World Series as it was, but I was happy that Clinton Kershaw, can, you know, won. A, I mean, they're, you know, Seager, they're like, there are stories. And I think that as a creative individual doing what I do, um, as a designer and as a writer, you look for you look for stories that can be told that really resonate. And it does kind of like hit back on this local level. And you root for some guys that that as players, even if you've got no affiliation with an Andrew McCutcheon, you like the way that he is and and you root for, you know, Ichiro Suzuki. My goodness. I mean, there there's no better example. Thank you for mentioning two of the cities that I've lived in, Pittsburgh, PNC <laughs> Park, Andrew McCutcheon, saw him play there. Great. Ichiro, Seattle. Great. Uh, and then as any baseball fan would like to know, guy with the golden sombrero, the fourth question, if you could think of someone that we should talk to next about baseball, or was I called baseball adjacent topics, who would you recommend? You're putting me on the spot, guys. You're putting me totally on the spot. I might have to like, we, we should take this conversation offline because <laughs> there are, I, you know, there are there are people who are names, but then there are people who you might not know who Even better. Would, be, would be a great sequence that you would have no idea. I have a couple of people in mind that I will mention after we finish here. Oh, that that's great. And I I, I have to admit, I took that segment from a, a very funny ESPN podcast into a, a, that's what she said with Sarah Spain. She calls it the Spanish Inquisition. <laughs> 10 rapid fire question at the end and i, I like the golden people. sombrero it's you know it's perfect I I, I I i thought about that but she's very clever like how she just does that and i appreciate the the the, the deference because like we were just curious like we found about your work through baseball tonight and your logos that we see all the time and like wonder what else and we had a great conversation so Thanks to you, Todd, for joining us today. Uh, for everyone listening, you can find his work at toddradom.com. You can listen to, you can find his book, Fabric of the Game, online. Well, it's able to be printed now because it's in such demand. Todd Radom, thank you very much for joining us today. Thank you. Right, thank you. What a, what a great conversation. It was a lot of fun. We love baseball. We love the minors. Here's to better times ahead together. 2021, nowhere to go but home. That's it for this episode of Center Our Baseball. This episode of Center Our Baseball is hosted and produced by me, Kazuki Akiba, and Brandon Beiser, guest starring Todd Radom. Please check out his latest book, Fabric of the Game, the stories behind the NHL's names, logos, and uniforms at a bookstore near you, as well as on various retail websites. Otherwise, please go to toddradom.com to learn more about him and his work. This episode was edited by Kazuki Akiba, with additional research by Brandon Beiser. Our theme song is by Kay Margus. Center Our Baseball is a production of Daylight and Media 3 Limited, We'll be back with another episode. If you like this podcast, please rate, review, and subscribe to our podcast as more people will know about this show. Go to daylightinteractive.com to see some exclusive updates and more about our upcoming shows. I'm Kazuki Akiba. I'm Tara Hori. And this has been Sound Our Baseball.